Yes, I wanted to thank the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation first very much for inviting me. Um, as I, I work in the European Parliament and there I'm often, um, well, how should I say, confronted with these Im images about the German energy transition. And um, sometimes it's very hard to answer those questions in a differentiated way because, let's say, there's one external um, view on the energy transition, on the energy transition, on the Energiewende, as you call it in Germany, which is very positive, where it's internationally an example because of the fostering of renewables and um, the share of 25 percent it has reached now. And then, but that's let's say that's history. That's like how how it was built up because of political, historical, and political conditions. And then there's always the internal view where you're faced with the shortcomings and the contradictions of, um, yeah, of this energy turnaround, let's say it so. so. And I would call that those are two different stories. So I want to tell you those two different stories. Um, first, I would, would focus on the, on the positive story, let's say, and I would call it the energy turnaround from grassroots. Um, and, and that story, without a doubt, is a huge success. It's a success um, on, of the movement. It's a success based on the, let's say, power on the streets of the anti-nuclear movement and of the environmental movement in general. Um, before the feed and tariffs were introduced, after the liberalization of, or the European liberalization of the, the electricity market, the four big energy corporations were governing and splitting the um, electricity system um, under themselves. Um, after the introduction of the feed and tariff of the German electricity, re renewable electricity law, they lost every year 1% of the market share um, and now only, uh, only own 5% of renewable facilities. 60% um, of renewable facilities are in the hands of citizens and, fa and farmers. Um, so looking at those facts, you quite, quite can argue that the hegemony of the four big corporations is challenged by the fostering of renewable energies. So um, as I said, it has been a huge su success. 400,000 jobs were created in this sector. It now um, creates a communal value of 8.9 8 billion. Um, and a boom of energy cooperatives is amounting to now over 600. Over 130,000 people are members of energy cooperatives. Um, and those have invested over 1.2 billion euros. So I guess that is a kind of development we like, we like to see from an emancipative point of view. Um, but there are also those contradictions. And in those contradictions, um, the alteration of the energy transmission and distribution networks is now decisive uh, for the system change of the electricity system in, in Germany. And at the moment, those grids are still designed for base load. So that means for coal and nuclear power. Um, and now electricity from, from renewables with a share of almost 25% reached a relative relevant quantity to bring the centralized structures of the power industry to systemic tipping points. Like just, let's say, talking about the finances of the four um, big corporations and again about the structure of the grid because we have, and the, the four big corporations every day, every year, they're losing huge amounts of money. Um, so how does the feed and tariff law function? The feed and tariff law is based on two major pillars. The first major pillar is, is, uh, is the priority for feeding of renewable electricity into the grid. And the second is the obligation of um, trend, the, of the, um, tr the, of the yeah, um, transmission system operators to connect new renewables to the grid. Um, there is um, investment security by long-term guarantees um, for f if you have fixed prices with different tariffs for different renewable technologies 
um, amounting to different quantities. Um, one of the success factors is that into the law there is built in the fixed cost degression of feed-in tariffs, which um, well makes the market um, um, in need of technological process um, and um, perhaps yeah, well, the major factor is the cost allocation on electricity prices for consumers instead of public subsidies or taxation. That is mostly uh, because um, like not having public subsidies or taxation, um, it takes the fostering of renewables hands out of the hands of changing political majorities. Um, yeah, which were those conditions of success I'm talking about? Um, I would say the renewable electricity law was a very intelligent combination of planning and the market. Um, like it based on a political decision which granted market access and fixed prices um, for investors creating investment security and the market forces were mostly used for what they are good at for efficiency and technological progress. Um, and so the decline of prices for renewable um, were ensured by, um, yeah, by innovation, um, um, decline, declining the price of technological learning curve and the incentive for innovation through fixed degression of feed and tariffs. Um, so, yeah. So it has, it has lead to an enormous decline in the cost of key renewable energy technologies, mostly solar, wind, and wind turbines. The cost of power generated by wind and solar energy has decreased by 50% since 1990, and of solar energy by 80%. So um, this cri created dynamics and the speed of installation of renewable facilities um, questioned the hegemony of the four power corporations over the electricity market very much. But well, now I'm, and now I'm coming to the second story, to let's say the business as usual story. Um, and this story goes so that at the moment, um, let's say the four big corporations and their political supporters in the government try to regain the control over the development of the electricity market by slowing down the speed of the, the energy transition. Um, why do they do that? Well, they have to gain because delaying this energy turnaround means longer turning time, um, running times for conventional power plants, more opportunities for offshore wind, and more time to resolve, resolve problems of offshore wind farms so far. Two minutes. Um, they also they try to undermine public support to the energy turnaround by fostering a discussion about the cost of renewables and blaming the rise of electricity prices on renewable cost allocation. Well, now I'm coming, let's say, the contradictions. Where do they lie? At the moment, there are, old, there are eight coal-fired power plants being constructed, eight more in planning. So that means that energy savings and energy savings and energy efficiency are totally disregarded in this whole development. Um, the grid, grid expansion plans are on the basis of a business as usual scenario where coal is still deployed parallel to renewables. Um, and also the grid network development plan is compiled by exactly those companies uh, which have commercial interests of maximizing grid expansion in order to maximize profits. Um, they have an equity return of 9% guaranteed. Um, and they don't have a master plan, like there is no political master plan for grid, grid, grid expansion, which should include um, expansion of power storage, load management for heavy consumers, um, expansion of renewables in the south of Germany and energy savings. So, and also, let's say, the choice of funding policies of the last three years for different renewable energy sources was mostly in favor of centralized power structures, looking at the extra, extra, extraordinary reductions of solar power, halving of the feed-in tariffs since 2008, 
and also looking at offshore wind, where there will be no reduction of feed-in tariffs until 2018. Um, well, yeah, if, like, I guess to any further questions and also the political um, uh, battles around it, we can come in the discussion. Okay.